Hello, I'm Roberta Crisson. This is Facets, Politics 80, one of a series of political interviews uh, with ramifications for all of us this year of presidential elections. I'm privileged and pleased and honored to have next to me Mrs. Barbara Bush, the wife of presidential hopeful George Bush, who has survived a harrowing two days to get here and sit in here for our interview today. And I'd like to welcome you and say hello to Pennsylvania. And uh, I wish we had better weather for you, but hopefully it will clear soon. Um, Mrs. Bush will be speaking with us today on issues that are near and dear to her heart and which she feels are of vital importance to the country as a whole. I'd like to begin our questions, if I could, Ms. Mrs. Bush, on uh, a rather serious note. You brought in your bag this, uh, this morning with two small buttons on it, mm -hmm. something that you said was uh, very important to you, and I'd like for you to explain those if you could. Well, at a breakfast this morning, someone gave me two buttons, one for George and one for me that had a 5-0 on it. Uh, this was to, they said I must wear it until we get back our hostages. And I said to the lady, but there aren't 50 hostages, there are 53 hostages. Mm -hmm. And I feel very strongly that the President of the United States has really let us down. There are three hostages held by the government itself and mm -hmm. 50 held by the terrorists, so-called students. Uh, when the President says we've had a breakthrough, incidentally the day of a primary. We've had a breakthrough <laughs> and maybe we're going to get the 50 shifted over to the government. Well, what difference does that make? They've had three all along mm -hmm. and they have not returned them to us. So the government is not acting in good faith. And when the president puts 50 Christmas trees to symbolize the hostages, I think it's a deception to the United States public. There are mm -hmm. 53 hostages. So I think the button really sort of sad. Do, what, uh, what do you think should be done now? Uh, do you well, think there are other steps that need to be taken? No, I think the president has taken the right step. You know, George, about a month ago, mm -hmm. before the Illinois primary at a uh, World Affairs luncheon in uh, Michigan, uh, excuse me, uh, Illinois, mm -hmm. called for breaking off a diplomatic relations the complete economic sanctions and sending home the diplomats because he said enough mm -hmm. we tried the world court it didn't work we tried the United Nations Commission it didn't work we have got to show the Iranian government and the Iranian people that we are standing behind our commitments and our hostages so I think the president has finally done the right thing your husband said uh, last night on a on an interview program that in the areas of foreign policy and foreign affairs, he feels that he uh, has probably more experience than many of the other or most of the other uh, uh, men in the race, especially in answer to one question to Ronald Reagan. He felt that his uh, experience, especially in foreign policy, was yeah. what sets him apart from the others. I think that's only one thing, Roberta. I mm -hmm. think. Uh, and certainly in foreign affairs, George is the only person running for president who has been a congressman, the ambassador to the United Nations, the chief of the U.S. liaison office to the People's Republic of China, a fourth of the world's population, incidentally, and the head of the whole intelligence system. So there's no question about that. And I think that George better understands the world as it is and the fact that President Carter is reacting He's not acting. He doesn't have a plan. He just reacts to pressures and to different uh, problems that arise. He doesn't have a world plan mm -hmm. for the United States foreign policy. I think George Bush is the only person who really understands uh, the foreign policy situation. For instance, Governor Reagan, who is a fine man, but he has just the background Jimmy Carter had. He's a governor of a state. When asked what he should do about Iran, uh, excuse me, Afghanistan, he suggested that we blockade Cuba. Well, now, Cubans did not invade Afghanistan. The Russians did. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a different, um, a difference in the background. I also uh, would suggest that Governor Reagan 
along with President Carter, vacillates a little bit because when it came to boycotting the Olympics, they went back and forth and back and forth. There's no question in my mind that awful as it is that George was right about the Olympics. We must let the Russian people see that we are against aggression, we, that we are going to boycott the Olympics. You know, athletes are Americans too, and they're being asked to make a tremendous sacrifice. But better make that sacrifice than make one of serving your country in a war. Your husband has stated that he does favor uh, registration of the military since you, you he mentioned He doesn't it. think that we need to reinstate the draft now, mm -hmm. but he favors an equal registration across the board. Of, uh, is this to, to uh, like equalize the... the yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, this is what, we're, what I was getting at, I think, to uh, shore up a rather sagging um, volunteer registration. I understand that there are some shortages in middle ranks and what mm -hmm, have you mm -hmm. in the armed forces. But of course registration wouldn't do that, I don't believe, but it would just be like the Boy Scouts. You're being prepared. We're talking mm -hmm. about a world in a terrible period. The absolutely unthinkable is to go to war. George mm -hmm. feels that there is such a thing as peace through strength. Mm -hmm. uh, he feels that we have a much better chance to keep our country uh, out of war and have decades of peace if we are strong, but we have a much less chance if we are weak, and that goes across the board for defense spending. This was my next question in terms of defense spending. Um, your husband does favor an increase in defense yes. spending mm -hmm. in uh, any particular areas? Well, now, you've got me, Roberta, because I am not an authority on mm -hmm. MIRVs and that kind oh, of thing. Oh, of course not. But uh, George, I, I believe, feels that we have to uh, put back into the budget the defense uh, methods that President Ford had in, that President mm -hmm. Carter cut. I think President Carter's seeing that now. Plus, we must get back to the three of the <coughs> Navy, which we have lost. Yes. So I think in those fields, I'm really, that's not my field. <laughs> uh, I can well understand it. That uh, we wouldn't, uh, none of us, I think, is, is uh, an authority, on, especially on, on the areas of armed forces that need a special uh, shoring up, mm -hmm. but, but of course he does you say favor George the increased... is, though, because he presented the mm -hmm. intelligence and the estimates of what the Russians are doing to the President of the United States for almost a year. He knows about those things. He stated last night that in order to... I wish to... I'd heard him. <laughs> oh, well, I certainly wish you... You were supposed to be there last night, as a matter of yes. fact, weren't you? Mm -hmm. uh, he stated last night that there was a... Uh, in order to blockade Cuba, as you were mentioning uh, earlier, it would take almost our whole Atlantic fleet, which I think is indicative of what you're saying as far as our, our uh, Navy resources We no longer are. have a three-ocean Navy. Mm -hmm. and I, I, I would go a little bit further than George. I think if I were the Russians, I would say to myself, wouldn't it be grand if the Americans would blockade Cuba? That would take the fleet out of the Mediterranean, away from the Middle East, where the Russians really have their interests. And wouldn't it be, be like a chess game where we made the dumb move, I think? <laughs> It'd be interesting to see what would happen, but not very pleasant, I'm no. sure. Let's get to domestic fares, which I'm sure concern all of us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We all have to buy food and, and pay taxes and heat our homes, and I'm sure this is on the minds of many, many voters, perhaps even more than some of the foreign affairs. I'm sure that's true. Uh, how does your husband feel about inflation? Uh, how would he control it? He doesn't like it, I'm sure. How would he control it? How, well, let me first take? say uh, that George is the best qualified to solve the inflation problems of anybody running for president this year, too. George is the only person running for president in 1980 who has built a business, who's rolled up his sleeves and from scratch built a business. And for 21 years, George wasn't lecturing on the free enterprise system. He was out there doing something about it. He was a pioneer in the offshore drilling contracting business. I think that's an important qualification for president. He knows what it is to take risks, meet payrolls, pay taxes, and deal with government regulations. Now, having said that, uh, he also was a member of Congress and served on the House Ways and Means Committee, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate majoring in economics. I think mm -hmm. those are important qualifications. George says um, that in order to stop the inflation, 
you have to limit the growth of federal spending. That doesn't mean uh, no growth. George believes that there is room for growth in the economy, but it should be under the rate of inflation. I am not an economist, but I have heard him say that. But you should limit the growth of federal spending. Mm -hmm. You should cut government regulations that are strangling the free enterprise system. And I've seen two wonderful examples of that this week on my tour. You should enact the sunset laws, and we should have a strong, inventive energy program. Mm -hmm. If you do those four things, he then says you can cut government, uh, you can cut taxes by $20 billion, $10 billion to corporations and businesses with an incentive built in. You don't get the tax cut if you don't put the money back into the business for research and development, for retraining of people for jobs that are there, for moving to locations where there are, um, unem where there is unemployment and training people to the jobs and for energy conservation. The other $10 billion to go to private um, individuals if they will take that money and put it uh, into savings, home building, and energy conservation. It's an incentive-oriented um, tax cut. And I think that's one of the things we've taken out of our businesses. We've made it so attractive, uh, for instance, to a company who is making money, not to put money back in so that we can compete with foreign countries and have more productivity, we've made it more attractive for them to buy Sears Roebuck or Montgomery Ward or something else, but not to try to upgrade so they can compete with foreign countries. So um, that's George's solution. I think he's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm very <laughs> prejudiced. I can, I can understand that, and I, I would uh, probably be in the same straits. I was wondering about a comment that I had heard your husband make about stimulating production as another uh, aspect of uh, solving some of our economic woes. Now, part of this you explained in terms of the incentive mm -hmm. programs, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if that would be, if there was any other area that, that would work uh, along with this, such as um, uh, other uh, job programs um, to help unemployment? Training what? people for jobs that are there. For instance, mm -hmm. uh, CETA. Not all good, not all bad, but lots of it are training people for jobs that aren't there. That's really unfair because you are taking hope from people. In terms of training uh, for jobs that aren't there, could I you mean, explain that well, a little bit? Well, in Houston, Texas, for instance, we've trained uh, thousands of people and it turns out after they've gotten trained, the job isn't there for them. We ought to be training people for the jobs that are there, not for jobs that aren't there. But let me give you another example of uh, government regulations, because I'm sort of full of that this week. Um, <laughs> you mentioned that you had had some examples well, of that. Well, I really did. I went to uh, Rosemont Child Care Center in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. last week, actually. It was a wonderful child care center in a Hispanic neighborhood, and they had a third Hispanics, a third blacks, and a third white. And they are teaching uh, with bilingual trainings so that people keep their heritage. And it was a wonderful setup run by loving, I never saw such wonderful uh, loving people. And they were wringing their hands because these are welfare mothers that have been able to go back to work because of the uh, Title 20, whatever it is, grant, plus some local and some private. All of a sudden, the government comes in and says, you have to have one trained aide for every three children. Mm -hmm. It's unreasonable. I'm a mother of five. I did not have to have one and a half trained aides to bring <laughs> up my children. I mean, I, it's just unreasonable. So what happens is they can't take more children. and mothers who are eager to get off welfare mm -hmm. and eager to have their children in this program. It's a, a combination of the best of Project Head Start and the best of training people off welfare. It's a marvelous program, but government regulations are killing them. I went to Lancaster, Pennsylvania this week, a um, wonderful blind center. Mm -hmm. It was really great. They had people doing, and they've had this contract since 1967, evidently, with a shoe um, uh, cleaning. No, a, sh a shoe cleaning, you know, like um, 
a kit for shoe mm -hmm. cleaning. They've had this contract since 67. These are people who are legally blind. They were folding pieces of flannel, putting a sponge in, and sticking them into a plastic with no sharp edges. And they were a piecemeal job, and they were the fastest thing you ever saw in your life. Suddenly, government regulations come in and say, although these people have done the same job since 1967, it allows them the dignity of working for a living, that they have to have more supervisors. Well, that prices them out of the job market. A machine could do it cheaper. Mm -hmm. So they lo they've lost the contract? Well, they haven't, but they're going to. I mean, they're worried to death about it because they have to hire more people. That's wrong. We should be helping, mm -hmm. not over-regulating to death so that people can't um, get their jobs done. Now, I know in your area, uh, you have a very big work ethic. Yes. And that's wonderful. And so this, you can see how hard this would be for people who want to do a job and do it well. They want the dignity of doing, being allowed to work for a living. <coughs> and with the prices of uh, food and fuel growing increasingly every day, mm -hmm. because this is a community of industry and of manufacturing for the, for the most part, people are worried about their, their fuel bills and fuel oil is, a, is the mm -hmm. predominant heating uh, unit here. When you say fuel, fuel oil. Fuel oil. Uh, interesting. This is coal country, isn't it? It is. It is. Uh, there are, there's a lot With of coal. With government around. regulations, they'll keep oil. you from burning coal. <laughs> there is a lot of coal mm -hmm. burned in our area. Mm -hmm. However, uh, uh, heating oil and fuel oil is predominant mm -hmm. in the area. Uh, how does your husband feel about controls? Now, you're not going to believe this, but here I've told you that George is the best qualified person because of the economy, because of his background, education. Mm -hmm. He's the best in foreign affairs because of his jobs. He's the only person running for president who not only built a business, but who was in the energy field. Mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with having a president who knows something about something, incidentally. And George Bush knows about energy. Um, I'm feeling a little bit humble now because I don't know much about energy, but George <laughs> feels that uh, we have the know-how. And incentive comes into this, too. Mm -hmm. We should make it attractive for oil companies or independent, you know, 80% of the oil and gas in this country is found by independents, mm -hmm. to put back into their business to look for more sources of energy, more oil, more gas, and then alternate sources. And George feels that the government has a role to play in finding alternate sources of energy, whether it is taking the 200 uh, years of uh, coal that we know is in the ground, mm -hmm and cleaning it up, making it into, there's some way to make it into gas. I don't understand all that exactly. But we have the know-how, and we really have the ability in our country. We don't have the incentive. So George feels that we should have pilot programs around the country, not the, I think, 80 billion the president's calling for, or whatever it is, but a, a, with four big pilot programs, he feels that we can uh, put our know-how to use to find renewable sources of energy. Mm -hmm. We can clean up coal. We can use low head hydraulic energy. There's a regional also. I see you have gas a hole here. Mm -hmm. There are regional sources of energy around the country. Iowa uses gas a hole. In New England, they have a, um, they're, they're converting to wood burning, um, for wood for fuel, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. That there should be incentives. You should get tax incentives for that kind of thing and for research and development. We are a country that can put a man on the moon. We have not put enough incentive into finding new sources of renewable energy. Would this involve, then, would this involve decontrol of prices? George feels you should decontrol prices, uh, that it would uh, let level the, off at a, uh, the does proper... Does it permit the, the price to rise and, and level at a and particular... Level, yes. Rather than a, uh, let's say, uh, a 50 cent a gallon. Very much <laughs> against that. <laughs> well, because that's a tax on <coughs> only the people who really can't mm -hmm. afford it, George feels. It's not going to hurt the uh, upper class, so to speak, or financially, certainly. It's going to hurt the farmer, the taxi driver, the trucker. It's going to hurt just a very select group of Americans. Mm -hmm. That's not right. He just does not. But, and you add that to the 10 cent a gallon the president's already added. <laughs> so it's just not a fair tax. 
We're talking close to $2 a gallon for gas. Um, You're talking a dollar four at some stations here. I just saw yes. it last night. We did. We have a dollar four. Uh, a dollar twenty-seven. Mm -hmm. I saw it too. It, it varies you ha widely. You are paying less for gasoline than we are in Houston, Texas. Are you? <laughs> well, maybe we are. That ought to make you feel respect. good. We certainly should feel but, good. No, but we can't feel good about uh, what it's doing to the fuel prices for yes. uh, homes. Uh, we're, I mean, paying, your choice we're paying is, close to a dollar a gallon. For fuel do you eat here. or do you freeze? It's not such a good. Sometimes uh, it's a hard choice yes. to make, and especially for many people in our fixed area income. who are mm -hmm. on a fixed income, and uh, even for those who are in outside of the city, it's of course if you're in Lancaster, you know, it's rural. Roberta, people say to me, uh, "How do you feel about women's issues?" Mm -hmm. And I say, "I hope you're asking me about inflation, and energy, and foreign mm -hmm. affairs." Because that cert those certainly are women's issues. Women are the last to be hired and the first to be fired. They, they feel the inflation probably more than anyone because they're mothers and they're homemakers and they're workers. Budget makers. And That's right. So uh, please talk about presidential issues if you're talking about women's issues because um, I think they're women's issues. Probably that's why I haven't asked you about no, specific no, I'm not talking about you. issues. I, don't, I see. I'm just saying around the country, though. Uh, have you been Have you been uh, uh, asked about specific? Um, Women, so-called women's issues. That, issues that affect women that are not in the areas that you have uh, mentioned. Sure, but I, and I answered them. I don't think they're presidential. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can legislate uh, morals and standards. Mm -hmm. And I don't. Th first of all, the Congress. Uh, we ought to put the blame where it goes. The Congress is the uh, person who handles those things. And I think uh, I might make a little push for Pennsylvanians to get out and elect themselves a Republican Congress. We, for 40, out of the last 45 years, we've had a Democratic Congress. Mm -hmm. It hasn't worked too well. Congress is a very important body in this country, and we should be electing Republicans to it. This was one of my questions that I was hoping I would get a chance to ask, uh, because I, too, feel that the Congress is uh, the influential uh, uh, the president body. can lead, but the Congress makes the laws. That's right. And I think my question was, uh, how does he feel he can be more effective in influencing, uh, in asserting his leadership for, con for uh, uh, Congress as president? We've, had, we've seen uh, ineffectual leadership. Um, well, first of all, I think being, having been a member of Congress, is a tremendous help. You know, George was endorsed by more congressmen than anyone else running for president. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true today because, of course, some people have jumped on the bandwagon on the other side. But when it began, mm -hmm. more congressmen, over 35, endorsed George, including your own um, congressman, Bill Goodling, is our state chairman, and Larry Kauf Kaufman is our uh, is uh, is one of our vice chairmen. Herb Schnabley, an ex-congressman here. There's just a lot of people. John Ware, who have endorsed George Bush from your state. The, the last two are not seated congressmen. But they endorsed him because they've worked with him in the Congress. Mm -hmm. um, I could think of several Democrats who have said George was the uh, best there was. Wilbur Mills said when he was chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee and uh, congressman. Anyway, when George got through being the director of the CIA, said, I was against him in the beginning. I now say he's one of the best directors we've ever had. George works well with people. Mm -hmm. um, why he, would, why, is, why uh, do these people feel he was the best director that uh, the CIA had? Because I think they felt he was bipartisan, he was fair, he uh, built the CIA. He did not build himself. You know, I think that's an interesting characteristic of George. Uh, he is not a self-server. Mm -hmm. He's a builder. He's a doer. He did build a company. He did um, build relationships with the United States and China, which are important for world um, power, really, uh, the balance of power. We need the Chinese. They need us. Doesn't mean we need to turn our back on Taiwan, but it means that uh, we should build a relationship vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. At this moment, anyway, in history, the Russians are the threat. They're trying to take the word by world by force. Whether we admit it or not, it is true, and we ought to accept it, and so we need the Chinese. George rebuilt the CIA when the Pike Committee and the Church Committee had pulled it apart. He took over the Republican National Committee six months after Watergate and held it together. He's a builder. 
and I think um, he's the kind of leader that we really need now. We need someone we can look up to. We need someone who's not a self-server. We need somebody who, when he leads, looks over his shoulder and people are following. And that's why I think George can work with the Congress. He works well with people. And I think, um, I think that maybe is, is his biggest qualification for president. I keep finding bigger qualifications. <laughs> but he's the most decent, <coughs> wise, honorable man. He's very funny, too. Um, one would almost have to have a sense of humor having lived all of the places and missed, mm -hmm. I'm sure, planes and had planes grounded as you did. Um, I don't think all our presidents have had senses of humor. It's very important that they do. Why? Well, because you take yourself too seriously. Uh, you, you don't see the picture as a whole. You're so busy um, being self-centered. George is not self-centered. I think he is a, um, oh, I think he's a doer. Let me ask you this, since uh, we... Besides that, I have to live with him. I don't want to live with someone with no sense of humor. <laughs> we have a couple of minutes left. I'd like to, I'd like to sh uh, have you share with us how you see your, your own role uh, as a potential first lady. Mm -hmm. the, uh, we have role models in the past of active first ladies, of uh, less active first mm -hmm. ladies in a variety of areas. How do you feel? How do you see yourself? Well, um, because it is an important position. Of course it is. And I think by just being first lady, you have an obligation to do something to make your country better. Just by standing there, you can have an influence. And I have thought about that, Roberta. I wouldn't, I mean, I have to You're tell you. You're active I, campaigning. Well, because people ask right me now. that every day. So mm -hmm. uh, I jog every day three miles, and I thought about it a lot. And I thought, what, would, what could I do that would um, help America the most, not cost any government money, and not be controversial, feeling the president has enough problems without having a wife who's controversial? And I decided that the thing I could do that would help in every way, although I'd never worked in this field, well, I did once in Washington a little bit, but I thought I would push teaching Jane and John to read. I think that is one of the great lacks in our country. We're cheating our children, and I decided that oh, there are very many good programs out there. Uh, reading is fundamental. There are a lot of good ones, and that I could take a page from every First Lady's book, and Mrs. Johnson had doers' luncheons. I would do it in every way I could on the local level, asking experts in the field to help me. There are plenty out there. I would have Dutch treat luncheons around the country and have people from the libraries, the media, schools, school boards, everything I could think of. And I would try to encourage that world of people between the ages of 60 and 80 who have all their facilities, not all their energies, but enough so that they could help. I think there are a lot of there's a whole workforce out there mm -hmm. who want to be needed, who can, who could really add tremendously to the picture. We are graduating people from high school and college who can't read. That's wrong. So As I think an I educator, could do that. I, I know that. I'm well aware of Well, I'm not an educator, you say no, so. Well, you are a mother of five children, mm -hmm. so you are an educator in that sense of the word. Um, so your role would be in, to push in the areas of reading. reading and uh, furthering the, the educational process. Really reading. That. I, specifically I, I reading. specifically feel strongly about that. Mm -hmm. I have a child who is now a college, has a master's from college. He was of extreme dy dyslexia. Uh, he was lucky because we were able to help him. Mm -hmm. We have a grandson, the most adorable thing you ever saw in your life, who has a, a Mexican mother and obviously an American father. And he thinks in Spanish and speaks in English, therefore doesn't do either very well. Mm -hmm. He's lucky. He has a mother and father who have put him into a, a Montessori school where he's learning to read. It's important. We're lucky. I want to make that possibility for everybody. And so we hope that uh, for in your, in your aspirations that you're able to do this and for your husband, George Bush, who is um, pushing hard for the... Uh, a win in Pennsylvania next Tuesday in the presidential primary. We are out of time. We must say goodbye, but I, I thank you very much for coming to Reading and for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to share this moment with us and your feelings and to uh, bring to us the message from your husband. Thank I loved being here. Much. Thank you, Roberta. This is Roberta Crisson, Facets, Politics 80.